How are you? How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Thank, thank you so much for, for doing this with us. Um, Jerry moderates the discussion group Non-Duality Salon, which he founded in 1998. The people in the group and associated website, nonduality.com, introduced the word non-duality and the varieties of non-dual expression to the spirituality mainstream in a way that did not revolve around a single individual tradition, practice, or teaching, but embraced them all. At the time, it was a novel idea. The non-duality salon vision continues to play out today as a Facebook group, which all may join. It also plays out right now through this Nothing Conference. So thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for being a, the original disruptor <laughs> online. <laughs> um, Jerry is going to do a presentation um, lies my non-duality teachers told me. Thank you yeah, so much, Jerry. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thanks, Noel, Harry, and, and your, your team. You've got a great team there. It's uh, impressive what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I thought that was a good title. I thought it was a pretty good Yeah. Question. I thought yeah. it was a good clickbait, and then I got tired of the title, so I don't know. Okay. It's a, why is my non-duality team? I mean, <laughs> well, it just comes down, you know, a great writer, very radically non-dual writer. In fact, I think he's more radical some of the, uh, than some of the other people we've heard here today. Uh, Wei Wu Wei, he was a writer back in the 50s and the 60s. And he says something very famous. He said, the best writing, the best words, are only like taking pot shots at the moon. And that's all, you know, I don't care how non-dual or how extremely non-dual you're hearing anyone speak. It's a pot shot at the moon, you know, they're missing it. So we're all missing it. So in that sense, it's all lies. And um, yeah, every teacher has their way of speaking, their stories, their spiels, their confessions, their claims. And it's all filtered through their personalities and their, you know, our idiosyncrasies. It's all colored by our preferences and, and it's um, slanted by depending on who we're talking to. We're talking to a non-duality conference here, you can say anything, really. And in fact, you can say so much, it's, uh, it's confusing. I'm totally confused. Don't tell anybody, but I have no idea what's going on out there. It's... Um, but it's part of the non-duality culture. And there is a non-duality culture as I see it. I think that when we started out in 1998 online, it was, um, people never even heard of the word non-duality. So like eight or 10 people came together and started talking. And a, a culture has been built consisting of a lot of people, lots of groups, lots of teachers. And, um, and there's a culture and a culture is, is, is uh, defined as the customs and the arts and the achievements uh, and the efforts uh, of some group of people. And there's a culture of non-duality. There's, a, there's um, um, certainly some arts, probably could be more. And there's achievements, people do better um, in their lives. There's a certain customs, a certain way to relate to people, I think. Um, and certain groups will have their own customs. Some groups will say, you know, you can join my group, but I don't want to hear you say, I'm enlightened, you're not. You know, so that's, that's might not be a custom on some non-duality groups. Don't come here and say, tell everyone you're enlightened and they're not. So that might, now in another group, uh, it may be totally okay to say I'm enlightened and you're not. Because people have different needs. Some, some people need to hear that a teacher or a sage is enlightened and they're not. So people get served in that way. Other people don't want to hear that. So in the non-duality culture, uh, is uh, is made that way and you'll look at different you'll see different customs arts and you'll see different social platforms as part of it too and that's changing a lot and i heard someone ask a question i think they were asking jim newman what they thought of the future of non-duality that's like up my alley so i'm going to answer it and i i think it's uh it's going to bear on a lot of the new disruptive technologies and just as the internet disrupted um the advent of popular non-duality. New disruptive technologies are, are taking hold. It's not clear what, how they're having an effect. As far as live streaming, they are. I, I think that's something like twitch.com. I don't think anyone's doing non-duality on that. It's mostly for gaming and games, but they, they hold other chats. Um, 
other disruptive technologies are going to play a role. It's not always clear whether it's Bitcoin or electric vehicles, uh, uh, breakthroughs in 3D printing. Um, it's not clear how it's going to bear on non-duality, but, but it is, it, it has to. So, but, and we'll see how that plays out. Um, so what I want to talk to today, I was feeling like there's so much going on, so much talk going on in this conference. The, the diversity is tremendous. You, you can't be too diverse in, in a conference like this. So, but, but I, it made me think about how a person's spiritual life, this person's spiritual adventure can be broken up into stages. And I know there's the people out, say, out there saying, there's no people, there's no stages, there's no non-duality. There's only an appearance, there's only the vertical. The people that are speaking from that point of view, they're not, on, they're not talking about a horizontal linear walk. They're talking about the vertical now that's happening now. There's nothing can be said about that. There's nothing can be said about that. And they say that. And yet we appear to be walking, uh, well, you know, get rid of the word appear. We are walking a horizontal walk as well. You know, if I want to go to Burger King, I got to get dressed, put my shoes on and go to Burger King. It's a horizontal walk. Not a vertical appearance. Burger King doesn't show up here with you know some girl frying hamburger in front of me. Now, to someone's perception, who lives from the vertical, that may actually appear to happen. That they appear to walk to Burger King, um, and they know they know no such thing as a horizontal walk. And we hear those people those. Um, uh, people from Tony Parsons and Jim Newman group, they're very good at what they do. And, um, and, uh, and, and uh, at the same time, we hear people talk about how to deal with your emotions, how to deal with your thoughts, um, how to deal with your, your body, how to deal with social relations, how to deal with relationships at work. And a lot of time is spent, there's some beautiful people spending time with, with you, helping you to look at your thoughts. And at the deepest levels, they help you work with trauma, traumas and some ugly trauma, some hard trauma. So you can look at different stages on people's adventure. Uh, and I'm borrowing from these, these stages as developed by the controversial guru Adi Da, otherwise known as Da Free John. It's from his book, The Basket of Tolerance. And he talks, first of, first of all, establishing yourself in the first three stages of life. And those are body, mind, uh, and emotions. And this is something where, you know, I'm over 70. I'm still dealing with that. I can't figure out my body. I don't know what the hell my mind's doing and my emotions go here and there. This is something we got to work on all the time. And you have some very good speakers who can help you with that really, in real beautiful ways. And we need that. We need mentors to deal with our bodies. We need mentors to deal with our emotions. And we need mentors to deal with our minds. And, and they're available and, uh, and they're out there and they're in this conference. So this is the, called the first three stages of life, but it's the last three stages too. I mean, it's, there's no stopping in working on our trauma and in our, our thoughts, you know, the hockey game in the head. It's constantly going on. And so some of these mentors, guides and sages and teachers understand the hockey game in the head and they help us to expand the size of the, hunk of the hockey rink in our head so that the players aren't hitting each other that much and we can have a more peaceful life and get on with things. So those are the first three stages of life. The fourth stage of life, I'll go into later. The fifth stage of life, I'll go into. Sixth stage of life, I'll go into. But the seventh stage of life, that's what we hear when we hear Tony Parson speak and people like that and Jim, Jim Newman's beautiful speaker. And here, well, they've said it all. There's nothing more for me to say. Whatever I say is probably going to fall short because I don't really speak from that perspective. Even though I may live from that, I don't know. You can know if I do. But I don't really tend to speak from that. So it's not my thing. So what we see in this... Uh, conference center, people speaking from the first three stages of life, body, mind, emotions, 
here from the seventh stage of life. So we, we get that at the conference. Now you will get questions that bear on the fourth, fifth, and sixth stage of life. And those don't get a lot of attention, but I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna talk about, it. is there anything else I wanna say about the seventh stage of life? I might come back to that. I just got some notes I'm looking at. Uh, I'll come back to that after I hit the sixth stage of life. So, and uh, you know what, I'm looking at my clock here. I have no idea what the time is. I only talk for five minutes, I'm almost done. Okay. Um, so the fourth stage of life, this is uh, where the individual is healthfully integrated into the th first three stages of life, body, mind, emotions. And I'm not sure what healthfully integrated means. It's, it's, it's an endless process of integrating and, and getting healthier and better within those first three stages. But let's say you're healthfully integrated. You're living your life okay. And now you might find an attraction to a divine presence, a divine person. Um, or maybe you go to, to a, a church or a place of worship and you find a love for God. And many people have, have gone through that. Um, you're still yourself. You're still, you're still yourself. But you have a transcendent experience. And, um, and maybe you know as love or bliss. Uh, something transcendent like that. It, a union with divine presence or, or with God. But you're still very much in your body. You're just like a person who's having this experience. And it's not much more beyond that. Now in life, a person can, be, can live very happily and successfully just in those first three stages. You can pull, put your act together with your body, mind, emotions, you got it made. You know, they go to college, you know, become a doctor or an accountant, you know, get a great career, get married, have kids, go through the motions, and you can have a very successful life within those first three stages. If you happen to have an attraction to a divine presence or religion, God, as you know God, then you become a little bit of a weirdo. You're breaking out of those th first three stages. People will talk about you a little because, you're, because you love God. And people, people who are, who are, who are um, stabilized and very solid within the first three stages, they'll consider the fourth stage realizer as kind of a, you know, weird. So, but that's okay. That person can still function pretty successfully in, in the normal mainstream world with a fourth stage interest in God. But once you get into the fifth stage of life, things get a little weird because now, now you're more, now you have another union with the divine or with God or with reality or with whatever you want to call it. But now it's, uh, it's not just the body, mind, the emotions of you. Now it's the awareness of you. So now suddenly your attention or your awareness is having a unity experience. So the fifth stage is different than the fourth stage. This is more of a classical, mystical experience um, that happens with God or some other high spiritual presence. Basically, it's the fourth stage of life, except the, uh, the attention or awareness itself seems to have an experience with the divine presence or with God, rather than the mind, body, emotion complex having the experience. I don't know how people see the difference. I'm sure some of you have, have, have experienced this already. But again, a non-duality conference doesn't really cover the fourth and fifth stages because these are more experiences of oneness. And uh, we've heard, I'm sure you've heard in one form or another that non-duality is not the same as oneness. Because non-duality means not two, and oneness means the coming together of two or more parts to form a single whole. But clearly the, the difference between oneness and non-duality, oneness is a coming together of parts, two parts or more. Non-duality means there aren't two parts. So. They're extremely different. Still, in language, people will use the word oneness to refer to the non-dual reality. So we, you got to listen for that. You got to discern. You got to accept that. If people use oneness as non-duality, just you know, just accept that. But no, no, the real difference 
And especially when I'm talking about these fourth and fifth stages, these are oneness. These are not non-dual experiences. These really are oneness. This is the coming together of two or more parts. In the fourth stage, it's the coming together of something of the person's body, mind, emotions with uh, a divine presence, however that happens. And in the fifth stage, again, it's a coming together of more of uh, awareness with uh, divine presence. I got some quotes. I don't know if I should do it. Then you get into the sixth stage of life. I think I'm gonna, uh, just to clarify the, four, the fourth and fifth stages, I'm going to give some quotes of what, of what it is. And, and again, I know people listening, some of you already have these, ex have had these experiences and you've moved beyond them. You're in the non, we're, we're into non-duality now, you know, we're, we're in the, we're in the big leagues here. So there's an example, example from Jane Goodall. Everyone knows Jane Goodall worked with chimpanzees, great uh, environmentalist. And she describes her experience, which I call a fourth stage experience. She says, I was lost in awe at the beauty around me. I must have slipped into a state of heightened awareness. It's hard, impossible, really, to put into words the moment of truth that suddenly came to me then. Even the mystics are unable to describe their brief flashes of spiritual ecstasy. It seemed to me as I struggled afterward to recall the experience, the self was utterly absent. I and the chimpanzees, the earth and trees and air seemed to merge to become one with the power, spirit power of life, of life itself. So it sounds pretty non-dual, and yet later she says that, that afternoon it had been as though an unseen hand had drawn back a curtain, and for the briefest moment I had seen through such a window in a flash of outside. I had known timelessness and quiet ecstasy, sensed a truth of which mainstream science is merely a small fraction, and I knew that the revelation would be with me for the rest of my life imperfectly remembered yet always within. A source of strength on which I could draw when life seemed harsh or cruel or desperate. I don't know, I mean, the feeling I get from that is that this is a fourth stage um, experience of the, of the divine. The experience came, it was powerful. She lost her sense of self and it left and she returned to her body her body, mind, emotions. And the experience remains then, uh, she says, it would be with me for the rest of my life, um, a source of strength on which I could draw. So it, I don't know, I don't get the sense that it was totally and fully absorbed on a cellular basis by her body doesn't sound to me as powerful as a mystical experience. So I'll read you a mystical experience and see if you can discern the differences. And if you've had these experiences yourself, um, I'd like to hear about them, mention them, talk about them. And you can also um, comment on how those, uh, on, on your own adventure into non-duality, how you might've experienced a fourth or fifth stage and ultimately a sixth or seventh stage uh, awakening. So um, an example of the fifth stage of life, this is where I say awareness unites with God. So a classic mystical experience. Uh, Nancy Clark studies uh, near-death experiences and she was saying, she said, I was addressing the audience with a, a eulogy and I spoke perhaps three sentences when all of a sudden I became aware of a brilliant white light coming from the left rear of the chapel at the ceiling. I did not see this light with my eyes, but rather with some other explainable source. It was more of inner awareness. I find it very difficult to describe. I could see, but it, it was definitely not through my human eyes. Upon seeing this light, there was immediate recognition of my part that it was God. I felt I was in the presence of my creator, a very exhilarating spiritual feeling. I can't explain how I knew or how I recognized God's presence the best I can do is to say that there was a transference of knowledge placed directly into my consciousness. And I just think that that is a more intimate experience than what Jane Goodall had. And it's just from the reading. I don't know anything about their lives. I'm not judging them as 
the state of enlightenment of these human beings. I don't know. I'm just judging writings. And perhaps you can see a difference between the fourth and the fifth. The fifth is more of an awareness experience. And the fourth stage is more of a, a bodily awareness. But check me on that. Leave a comment. Let me know. Help me out here. I'm wandering through non-duality. That's the only way to do it. Now, there's a sixth stage of life, and this is pretty non-dual. This is what a lot of us come to. It's a lot of us stay at. And it's only when the, the, the sixth stage dissolves that you find yourself, you know, you're in the seventh stage. You're, you're Tony Parsons. So and that just dissolves. That can just happen. So the sixth stage of life is, um, is further down the rabbit hole. In, on our, in our adventure in, into uh, non-duality, we, uh, it's like going down a rabbit hole. You kind of know that. You know that going in. You know, I'm going to explore this non-duality stuff. I'm going to go to a talk, a satsang. And you know you're going down a rabbit hole. And sometimes we think we've come to the bottom of the rabbit hole. But uh, maybe it's a fourth stage or a fifth stage experience. The demand of non-duality is always to go beyond. Always go beyond. You keep going beyond until there's no one to go beyond anymore. So when you go down the rabbit hole and you think you're at a bottom, you have to keep digging because, uh, because that bottom is not solid. You keep digging and that bottom will give way and you'll fall further down. And you can, so you can come to the sixth stage of realization or sixth stage of life from the fifth stage. Um, if you keep digging through the, uh, through the rabbit hole. So in the sixth stage, you sort of come home to attention or awareness itself. And you, you come to realize the nature of the self, you realize that there's only consciousness Yet, yet you're still holding on to something palpable that represents what you're about to melt into. It represents the seventh stage. So for me, it was um, the I am. So when I was pursuing, um, I was pursuing non-duality. I pursued the I am. And the reason I did that is because I had initiations as a, as a kid. I had several initiations. It wasn't until I was in my 20s that I looked back and put those initiations uh, together and saw what was happening. But when I saw what was happening, I realized, you know, if I want to if I want to um, have an adventure in enlightenment or non-duality, I didn't know the word non-duality, but if, if I just wanted to pursue my interests, I had to follow the I am. So I did that. I, I worked a job, a hard job, a stressful job in a restaurant. But for two years, all I did was focus on I am, pay attention to I am. That's all I did. And I knew what I am was, it was, it was palpable. It was my sense of being. And I knew I just had to pay attention to that. At the same time, I had a question. And the question was like, what is this? Like, what's, you know, what's going on in the, like, what's the universe? What's existence? What's the secret of existence? So I had both those two things going. That was my practice. That was my sixth stage practice that I just invented myself. Now it turns out the Sargadatta talked about that. That's how he achieved the realization by thinking about I am, but, but I, didn't, I, I just did it on my own because I had experiences from childhood. So um, I don't know, maybe he ripped me off. What do I know? So um, after two years, something happened and it just, I didn't even notice it until one day I was no longer focusing on I am. Um, the question I had, you know, what is going, what is the universe all about? That stopped and two things happened. One, I uttered, kind of quietly uttered, spontaneously, there was only one day. So I had the realization, I think this was like 1977, there was only one day. I just knew that. I just, that's all I realized. 
The other realization was that my question of what existence was about was resolved when uh, I, I saw that everything was the answer. Nothing was not the answer. I mean, you, you could say literally every atom was the answer. And it's not an answer I can give. It's just that they were the answer. The existence itself was the answer. And that was plain. I never had to ask that question again. That gone, done. That job was done. So then, you know, what do you do after that? Um, and by the way, Nisargadatta wrote about the I am. I, mean, I want to say two things. One, some people have no clue about this I am stuff. You know, I mean, I got friends who say, what is the, I, what are you talking about the I am? There's no I am. Other people experience the I am, and some don't. So if you're listening to this, you may experience it and you may have questions about it. And you may say, and the person sitting next to you say, like, what I am? What the hell are you talking about? So both things happen. The Sargadatta said from uh, I am that, he said, I simply followed my teacher's instruction which was to focus the mind on pure being I am and stay in it. And I used to sit for hours together with nothing but the I am in my mind and soon peace and joy and a deep all embracing love became my normal state. In it all disappeared, myself, my guru, the life I live, the world around me, only peace and unfathomable silence uh, remained. Now, the Sargadatta also, in other places, talks about the, there being no I am, that there's a, a place beyond the I am. And, this, and that's, that's, that's the seventh stage of realization where, you know, you're Tony Parsons and Tony's coming from and those guys. Um, so how do you go from the sixth stage where you realize there's only the consciousness, you have the same realizations as the seventh stage, but you're still kind of holding on, there's still a palpable sense of beingness. There could be, you may not even have a word for it. It could be the most subtle attachment, but it's there. For me, it was the, I called, I called it I am. So how do, how do you, how does that go away? How does that dissolve? Well, I, you know, I think it just does or it doesn't. I mean, none of this stuff I'm talking about is necessary, right? I mean, no law anyone has to pursue non-duality. You know, like I said er earlier, you can live a very happy life, probably a happier life, in that first three, uh, with the first three stages of taking care of your body, mind, and, and emotions, and getting, a, getting a real job and uh, having a happy life. You don't need to go beyond that. It's not even recommended to go beyond that necessarily, but those of us who are stuck here in non-duality land, we're here. What are we going to do? You know, we're in the dream together. And it is a dream. And all right, so I've talked about the sixth stage of life, and probably a lot of you are in that, or you've experienced it, or you've gone beyond it. Some of you are still working in the first three stages of life. Again, I, I like to hear in comments what your uh, perspective and experience is with all this. So when the I am or whatever it is you're holding on to, when that dissolves, and there's no way to, I don't think there's any way to dissolve, but it just happens or it doesn't happen. And it doesn't matter if that doesn't happen. So then you end up in the seventh stage of life. And here's, um, there's just no, you've heard, if you've been listening to the speakers on the nothing stage, uh, then you know what that's about. It's just nothing to hold on to. There's, it, there's true non-separation. It's non-separation in the truest sense. So whenever you ask a question to someone, to a seventh stage realizer, and that's not what they would call them. They're not, you know, they're not calling themselves seventh stage realizers. Tony Parsons isn't walking around with a sign saying, I, I'm a seventh stage realizer. I get that. So, But when, when, you, when you're coming from that place, and I get it, there's no one coming from it, and there's no place, this is true non-separation. Okay, I get it, it's not true non-separation. Because to call it true non-separation is an act of separation. So this is the seventh stage. This is the slippery slope 
of non-duality. This is where anything you say is not complete and it's not correct. It's a pot shot at the moon. It's a lie. And, and teachers will tell you that. I mean, they'll tell you, look, don't believe anything I'm saying. You got to find out for yourself. And that's always, that's always the demand from any teacher. You have to do it for yourself. Now realize was at this, uh, at the seventh stage. And you know the seventh stage because Tony Parsons is walking around his apartment with a sign saying, I'm a seventh stage realizer. I kidding, I kid, I kid. So um, realizers in the seventh stage really could appear to be crazy. Like, you know, I'm, I'm starting to act a little crazy here. And I'm just like a first stage realizer. So you can imagine the seventh stage realizers. But they do. There, there could be a crazy lifestyle associated with them. A seventh stage realizer could be uh, living in a herm living in a palace with golden walls, or he or she could be a hermit sleeping on a park bench. Same thing. Same realization. The way life plays out. I mean, who knows? Who knows what happens in that? One thing I'd like to see in non-duality culture, and I. I, I don't, I'm not seeing enough of it. So I'm complaining. So as a complainer, therefore it's, it's obvious I'm not a seventh stage realizer. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the lowest levels of realizers probably if I'm complaining. But I'm not complaining, I'm pointing out that, you know, you know who I've heard quoted a few times? Shakespeare. Shakespeare quoted a few times. Chuck Hillig, just recently. Chuck Hillig quoted Shakespeare. There were a couple of references to Shakespeare in Jim, Jim Newman's talk. And that's just the recent talks. You think Shakespeare was a um, seventh stage realizer? You think he fully knew and fully understood and fully aligned with uh, the teachings of Tony Parsons and Jim Newman? It wouldn't surprise me. And yet look what he created, people, things. Tremendous dramas. He became the greatest writer in English literature in history. So now more, in more modern times, you have other enlightened people that I would call seventh stage realizers. Van Morrison was an enlightened guy. Great songwriter. He wrote, uh, you know, Tupelo Honey and all those songs. In an interview, and he wrote, he wrote mystical songs. He wrote In the Mystic. He wrote songs about enlightenment. He was an enlightened guy. In an interview, he was asked how he writes songs. He says, well, I have a blank sheet of paper in front of me and I pretend I'm not enlightened. Out of the seventh stage realization, there's a vast, vast room for creativity. The trillion galaxies that are out there came out of seventh stage realization, out of non-separation. Because there's non-separation, there's an infinity of creative potential. It just makes sense. Again, in modern times, uh, Jim Carrey doing a good job. Jim Carrey's like, I think, like a seventh stage realizer, totally into non-duality and a very creative guy. Painter, he just wrote a book, actor communicator. He's crazy. He's out there. Maybe a guy like Andy Kaufman, if you remember Andy Kaufman, maybe he was a seventh stage realizer. I don't know. I don't know for sure. I read a book and reviewed a book and did some promotion for uh, Richard Boehmer, who wrote a wild, crazy friggin' book on uh, non-duality. Richard Boehmer was an actor. I think he was best known for uh, his, 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 some great television roles and also played uh, Tony in this movie West Side Story. So you got to go back. You got to be an older person from the 60s to uh, remember to remember Richard. But uh, and he also did some films, too. That few people know about. Um, so my call for non-duality culture is get some more creativity, get, get off your seventh stage asses and be creative. 
not enough to just jabber on on uh, on, on uh, friggin' satsang. Where's Shakespeare? You know, where's where's the Jim Carreys? Where's the Van Morrison's? So I know it sounds like I'm dissatisfied, and if I'm dissatisfied, I can't be enlightened. Who cares? And, and, and I do love, probably more than anything, I love these seventh stage teachings that I'm seeing being, being done. One of my favorite books, and I got it here, is the Abhadhuta Gita. I don't know if it's on the screen. I'm not looking at the screen. I'm not looking at the video. So um, and some, these are beautiful expressions. So you can find them in modern, modern speakers and go to their satsangs. And you can read scriptures, and, and, and they're very extremely non-dual. There's no abiding here. You don't, you don't hear about abiding. No one's abiding in anything. So a hint to whether something is not quite extremely non-dual is when they talk about abiding. Because who is there to abide? Abiding is a duality. So some scriptures talk about abiding, abiding in this, abiding in that. Consider the possibility that when you see the word abiding, that there's a subtle duality there, maybe a sixth stage presence rather than seventh stage. What am, how am I with time? Just wondering. Doing well. You're doing well. There's a, there's a, a, a question here, um, a bit controversial, oh. but would you like me to read it? What are your yeah. thoughts on the shadow side of Adiba, Ramesh, Mutkananda, and other teachers who have inspired many, but are also accused of abusing some of their closest followers? Yeah, well, it's true. I think we all have a dark side, and this goes back to what I talked about, the... Uh, I, I, I shouldn't say I, I think it's true. It may be true. It's allegedly, these things allegedly happened. Um, so, I mean, they're no different than me. The only, this is, goes back to the first three stages of life. Your body, your mind, and emotions. You've got to manage them in a way that's going to keep you out of trouble. You know, I have a dark side. I'm not the only one. I, I assume I'm not the only one. But you have to have the discipline to keep, to um, not let it get you into trouble. These people let it get into trouble. They couldn't stop. They, they, whatever they did, I don't know, remember exactly. But um, they lost control. That's how hard it is to keep control of your body, mind, and emotions. It's not easy. You got to work on that. You really got to work on that all the time. I mean, literally, to the day, you, moment you die, probably. To the moment your body's gone. You got to keep working on that constantly. I do, you know, and I have a dark side, but you got to manage so it doesn't keep you in trouble. So yeah, they had a dark side that got them into trouble. You know, a relationship with a spiritual teacher is like, once I was driving in the country, it was a dark road, and there were no street lights. I was going at a moderate speed, and then suddenly I see a fox in the uh, middle of the road. And my lights shined on its eyes, its eyes, and I stopped my car. His eyes were beautiful. They were bright orange, just beautiful. And his eyes were stuck in my headlights. And for two or three seconds, we just were both frozen, me and the fox. I was frozen by his beautiful eyes. He was frozen by my headlights. Then after a couple of seconds, he, he ran off and I, I drove on. And that's a lot what relationship is with a guru or a sage. You get caught in his or her headlights because, because of their peace or their wisdom or something. Sometimes just the feeling that they generate. I've seen teachers, they walk in a room and, and the whole room feels good. You know, it's like, they're like a drug. Presidents can be like that too. They, they create a presence that it's like a friggin' drug. They get your happy chemicals going. So that's like seeing the, the eyes of the fox. You get caught in the headlights of the teacher, the headlights of their beauty. And you have an entranced look upon you. And then the teacher sees your entranced look and they become entranced by it. You become a fox to them. Then you got this fixation happening. And it's unhealthy. And in that atmosphere of unhealthiness, of kind of, of addiction, the dark side is, then becomes harder to manage. But everyone has a dark side. Everyone has to manage it. 
So I hope that approaches the question. Some do you have, no, you have another question for me? Yes, I do. Hi, Jerry. I appreciate this is from Anonymous. I appreciate what you are sharing with us. Thank you. Who is your biggest influence on this path? Um, my own inner guru. I had my own um, experiences as a kid. Um, just spontaneous things that happened, uh, spontaneous utterances of I am. I, I was visited by, vis uh, by gurus in, in, a, in a vision three times around the age of 10 and 11. Uh, years later, I recognized one of those gurus as Nityananda, Swami Nityananda. Um, so I had visionary experiences. I didn't know what to do with them until I was in my 20s. But they initiated me with a chant. I won't say what the chant was, but they, they said, pronounced that chant three times on each of three occasions. I, know, I, I was scared. I was a kid. I didn't know what it was. I thought I was having nightmares. But years later, I figured out what it was. Um, I've had out-of-the-body experiences in which I uh, just saw my body breathing. And then I would turn in the other direction, away from my body, and there would be a sky full of stars. I recognized those as past lives. And um, one of those stars opened, I entered it. I recognized that as another initiation into the reality of I am. Um, but then, you know, I got into my 20s. I needed to make more sense of this. I needed some traction. So I enjoyed the writings of uh, Osho, who, who wrote under uh, Rajneesh at the time. And I enjoyed um, the writings of Dafri John or Adi Da mainly those two. And, um, but I also explored um, like science of mind, Rosicrucian cosmos conception, all kinds of, uh, you know, a lot of Kundalini because I was having Kundalini experiences. So I explored all of that stuff. Um, so I, I never felt a need for a physical teacher because I had these inner teachers, but I do access teachers often. My, my close friends are spiritual teachers, yogis, yogis and teachers of great people who are my teachers. And, um, and I watched some videos and, and uh, so I was influenced inwardly, internally. Thank you for your question. There's more questions here. Uh, uh, this one is from Julia. I like your call for creativity. I often imagine singing Nandawality music with Kirtana and James Corbin on carpool karaoke. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Let's go to no, Mario. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead. Was there more no, no, the no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, Julia. Thank you for your question. Gee, I, you know, I wish this COVID thing would get over because I love karaoke. I love going to karaoke. Me too. Are you a karaoke? <laughs> I'm a karaoke singer. Are you really? Yeah, 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 yeah. I love okay. singing. All right, look, we, we got the next, we got the karaoke room for the next. Nothing. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. <laughs> and Julia is going to show up. And yes. Julia, um, pursue that. You know, we see non-duality expressed in lots of talking and writings, but non-duality is expressed by Van Gogh. It's expressed in, in the haiku, Japanese, the haikus. It's expressed in, in painting and in sculpture and in architecture. There are architects who are non-dualists. I mean, any art, can, you can find... Um, someone coming from non-duality who created it. And also you can find that same art can inspire an experience of non-duality. Certain architecture does that. Makes you feel spacious and approach a sense of the non-dual. So pursue your creativity, pursue your art. I'm going to speak for Emerson here and say there probably might be a place for you on the conference. <laughs> uh, if you go to now the Science and Non-Duality Conference, it uh, does have a lot of creative stuff. They have singers and all kinds of stuff. Um, no, but the hip-hop interview that um, you did with um, Justin Miles, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was beautiful. Thank you. So bring, bring Julie be part of it. Join in, jump in, and do it. <laughs> yeah, that was a... Go ahead. Uh, that was a beautiful interview. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it was beautiful. It was just tears in the middle. We're listening to some hip hop. It was beautiful. Um, and uh, he could not do the live stream, unfortunately. So we recorded it. The funny thing about that is people saw me in two stages. 
So I had a beard in the other one. And the other one, I'm, I'm shaved now. So they're like, how is Summerson appearing in two stages? Amazing. <laughs> Non-duality. It's a non-dual thing. You just shave in the middle of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, go ahead and pursue that. And uh, yeah, it, you know, non-duality, the adventure in non-duality is not about talking like these non-duality people you see talking. Like, I'm definitely not a talker. I don't really like giving talks. I'm, I'm more of a community organizer and I don't know what I am. But um, yeah, did I finish my talk? I think I basically finished. I went through these seven stages. Yeah, that was brilliant. Made them, made, made them all pretty, pretty clear. Yeah, they are. They are. There's another question here um, that, that it relates to what you were talking about earlier. Would you say there's another stage past the I am? Uh, yeah, I think that um, what I was, what I was um, trying to make clear in my talk is that, well, first of all, it depends how you define the I am. So I'm defining the I am as something palpable, some kind of um, presence. Um, and there is a stage beyond that when that presence dissolves. That's the, the seventh stage then would open up. That's the, that's the stage where people say, you know, there's no you, and there's and all that stuff that you hear. Now, it depends how you define the I am. If you, say, if you define the I am as that seventh stage, and you want to ask if there is a stage beyond the seventh stage, yeah, I mean, there's the atmosphere in which all these stages exist, right? You can say that. Mm. What's the atmosphere in which they all exist? Um, that's... It's the atmosphere in which everything happens, the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything. Thank you. Uh, one commented, uh, Julia commented that Nisarga that a smoking could have been considered a dark side. How is smoking different from womanizing? Well, I do both. I smoke cigars and I womanize. Now, I'm very successful at cigars and I'm... <laughs> pretty big failure at womanizing. It's like, I've tried to be a scandalous guru, believe me. I've, I've tried to be, but none of the girls want to go out with me. So the hell with <laughs> I can't, I'm not good at womanizing. But, um, but uh, yeah, nothing wrong with smoking. I mean, I smoke cigars, but um, well, there, I mean, health, health wise, yeah. And on the level of body, mind, emotion, obviously don't smoke, you know. I don't smoke a lot couple cigars a month but uh um womanizing look like i said you have to and i don't womanize by the way but and i never have but um i was just fooling around but uh again on the level of body mind emotions we all have dark sides you got to manage it you got to manage it don't do crap that's illegal it's going to get you into trouble you got to stay out of trouble and, you know, if a person can master that, they would be pretty successful in life. You can keep your life together on those levels, financially and health-wise and relationship-wise. You can be, do okay in life. So, um, yeah, some gurus womanize, and um, they're just failing at the level of, uh, of the body, mind, and emotions. But they're succeeding in other areas. That's how I see it. <laughs> There's a question here. I had from Anonymous, I had a full-blown Kundalini release that lasted for about 15 months. And during this Kundalini release time frame, I experienced infinity and what I would know now to be probably be non-duality. Do people typically experience non-duality through Kundalini release? The people that know non-duality or that say that they, understand, they have a knowing of non-duality or experience it? I don't uh, think that... let, me, let me, it basically this person is trying to say that they had a full-blown Kundalini release that lasted for about 15 months. And during this Kundalini release time frame, this person experienced infinity and what this person would know now to probably be non-duality. The question that, that this person has is, do people typically experience non-duality during kundalini release? 
Not necessarily. Um, not necessarily at all. In my Kundalini experiences, I can't say I, I experienced non-duality. I experienced more of a fifth stage mystical. But I was already in probably a sixth or seventh stage. And the fifth stage was, uh, was more mystical and, and more amazing probably than, than non-duality. Um, so no, I don't think it's very, I don't think it's necessarily very common according to um, what I've read and, and heard and, uh, and studied. But Kundalini seems to be a real phenomenon and, uh, and it's, it's connected with, uh, I talked earlier about the uh, innovative disruptive technologies that non-duality is going to interface with and that hopefully the Nothing Conference and Emerson and you guys will be able to capture some of that interaction and disruption. And, you know, Kundalini is very associated with UFOs, which um, I know people think is weird, but the uh, Navy has admitted they exist. Scientific American has admitted they exist and is calling for scientific investigation. Um, the technology of uh, the UFO is very disruptive. Um, and the phenomenon itself is decentralized, just as non-duality culture is decentralized. A lot of disruptive technologies are gonna be able to use the technologies discovered through UFOs. The government has admitted they have materials from crashed UFOs. So um, Kundalini bears on a lot of things. And, and it's not something to hear about. I don't know even know if there's a place for it in, in non-duality culture, but it, it finds a place, it shows up. And, and as, someone, um, as someone who promotes non-duality culture, I, I accept everything. I accept, certainly accept Kundalini experience, especially since you know, I've had it myself and uh, I seem to recognize the power of it and its interface with non-dual experience as you've had. Yeah. Mark asks, can you discuss your toughest existential crisis? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, my life hasn't been too, I'm not sure what that means, existential crisis. Does that mean whether I want to live or die? Whether I can't, whether I can't go on anymore or whether I'm struggling the meaning of life? Like the existence, I, I guess, it could be. A I never had, never had any really, I don't think I've ever had any um, question. Um, I've heard people ask questions on this conference regarding Dark Knight of the Soul. I never had anything like that. Um, not really. I, I grew up as a kid with migraines, hundreds of, hundreds of painful migraines. I was in pain most of my childhood and um, Migraines are more pain. I've had kidney stones and gallstones, and migraines are far more painful. I've had hundreds of them, but and none of that ever made me. I never considered any of that um, forming a an existential crisis. So I don't know. I mean, physical pain didn't do it, and mental pain didn't do it. Um, when I was a kid, after I had some initiations into the I am, I would say to my brothers or friends, you know, I just feel like dying. I sort of wanted to die, but it wasn't out of depression or unhappiness. It was like, yeah, what's the point of life? It's just like, I don't know. I just, I just didn't see the point of anything, but I wasn't, I wasn't depressed or unhappy. I don't think I was, I don't know. I just thought life was, I, I've always felt that I was, uh, the only reason I'm alive is because I think, you know, if you believe in reincarnation, I think this was meant to be my life off. And for some reason, somebody got sick and they called me in to live. And it's like, okay, I'm just going through the motions here. You know, I want to go back. I don't know. Does that make sense? Totally. Well, Again, I, found, I found the well, most, I finally found an enlightened question here. And I'm going to ask you, this is, this is the, the enlightened question. Jerry, what is your favorite cigar these days? Oh, get me started on cigars. I got some, 
I like Her Herrera Esteli is my favorite cigar right now. Her Herrera Esteli, but from Drew Corporation. I um, love Cuban cigars. Uh, Partagas, I love Partagas. D, number four, it's a classic cigar. I love other Cubans, uh, other Cuban cigars. Um, um, and Nicaraguan cigars are, a lot of Nicaraguan cigars are, are great. Uh, my friend brought me some Nicaraguan cigars from uh, Denmark that were some of the best cigars I ever smoked. So, um, but my go-to cigar probably would be um, uh, Drew Estates, Herrera Esteli. I really like those. Thank you for the question. It's finally. Finally. Okay. That's the one. That's Not the question. <laughs> That's the clap. Sorry, go ahead. And one of my great spiritual experiences was with cigars when I was smoking them. Um, I don't know if I should go into that, but uh, I, I had great spiritual experiences with cigars when I was smoking back in around the age 25. I found some um, great cigars. I smoked many boxes of them and the scent of it. They were pre-embargo Cubans. I paid 65 cents for them back in the 70s. Today, if I save them and preserve them, they could be worth $1,000 each. Pre-embargo Cuban. The taste is like nothing I've ever experienced. And I smoke Cubans. The taste was so rich. It was so earthy. It was so organic that it created a, almost a shamanic experience for me whenever I smoked them. I felt this oneness, I guess, with the earth and with the land. And uh, it was very, it was a, there were profound experiences. So I like cigars for that reason. They come from the land and they're rolled by people who, who love their work and they're touched by human hands. There's a lot of um, depth and I think, that, you know, shamanic power in, in good cigars. So it's an experience for me. Cigars are kind of a spiritual experience. When when I when, when I see you, I'll I'll, I'll try some. <laughs> yeah, I'll bring some. <laughs> I want to try some. Uh, the uh, we we only have a few minutes left here, but I'll have a couple more questions. This one is: um, you mentioned tough times early on with some of your visions after initiations. You broke up a little. Emerson, can you repeat it, please? Yeah. You mentioned tough times early on with some of your visions after initiations. That's basically the question. Tough times after <laughs> initiations. Mark is asking. Oh, okay. Maybe Mark can. Uh, he said, Dark Net of the Soul. You mentioned tough times early on some of your visions after initiation. So maybe it's referring this as your Dark Net of the Soul. Yeah, I, I never had a dark night of the soul or tough times. I mean, same tough times any teenager or anybody growing up in college and stuff. You know, I didn't know what I was doing or anything. So, um, but I never had tough times to the point where I, I was suicidal or going to go crazy or went on drugs or drank. I never did anything like that. So, um, I never, I can't complain. You know, I, I'm not one of those people that uh, had a dark night of the soul or anything, but um, I did have a challenge, you know, integrating some of these initiations I had as a kid and knowing what to do with them. But, uh, but no, I can't complain. Can't complain about uh, anything. So. Last couple of questions here. Uh, Susan Hill, Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. Can you comment on that in relation to truth? Yeah, you sort of have to follow something. I think you have to follow. Uh, Sargadatta said that uh, that uh, freedom is the ability to do what you need to do. But how do you know what you need to do? What do you follow? What voice do you follow? I think it's more than just following your bliss or following your happiness or following your enthusiasm. I think you have to follow what you can't not follow. So for me, uh, getting into non-duality and stuff, I mean, I was choiceless. It wasn't, it wasn't a good idea. 
wasn't an idea. It was like, you know, I got to do this. I got to talk about non-duality. So at a time, no one heard of the word, so, but I did it. So it got lucky because people liked it. People it struck a chord. I've done other things that I felt were choiceless and they failed. People just weren't interested. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, you got to do more than follow your bliss. You got to follow that which can't not be followed. You got to find out what that is. Thank you so much. Um, any thoughts on about psychedelics and non-duality? Someone's asking. Looks like psychedelics are going to start becoming legal, like marijuana is legal. Um, I don't recommend psychedelics. I'm the kind of guy that says, let, you know, let the universe take care of you. You know, I'm not going to take a drug and push things along. But if it's one of those things you have no choice, but you got to do it, you know, do it in a careful way. They can be very helpful. I have no interest in it. But uh, I had an experience with DMT that was, uh, I call it pre-DMT experience. And um, some of you might know DMT. A book was written about it by Rick Strassman called, I think, The Spirit Molecule. So I have a, if I have time, I have a story. And sure, yeah, there's a couple. Yeah, about three minutes. Should be enough. Okay, so the story is that when I was in the eighth grade, the teacher was, was showing the parts of the brain, and she pointed the cerebellum, the cerebrum. She said what they did. And she pointed the pineal gland. She said, pineal gland doesn't do anything. And I was kind of staring out the window and suddenly I woke up, I became startled and I just knew within. I had an inner knowledge saying it does something. The pineal gland does something. So that would have been like in the eighth grade. By the time I got into college, I met a guy who was interested in the pineal gland and we started doing research on the pineal. This was the University of New Mexico. That research progressed to the University of New Mexico Medical School. And that research attracted Rick Strassman, who then did, then did work on DMT. So what inspired me to say the pineal gland does something? Where did I get that flash of insight? I, I suggest that, it, that DMT, that was a DMT experience, but a pre-DMT. So in other words, the intelligence of DMT extends before you even take it, before it's even discovered, possibly. So I think that was a DMT experience for me because it led to um, studies on DMT. So I wouldn't take DMT. I feel, already feel DMT was given to me in some form. So if you go to the University of New Mexico, you'll see there was a lot of DMT and pineal gland studies done there. And we were on the uh, kind of ground floor of that. So I'm not in favor of, I'm not in favor or against taking, you know, uh, entheogens, but uh, it's got to be a must for you. It's got to be choiceless. Don't do it because, hey, you know, it's Friday night. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we, we'll, we'll do some cigars and karaoke. <laughs> I think that's what we need, you know. And yeah, um, yeah. I want to thank you. I want to thank all the questioners. Thank you very much. Thank it's, you so much. Thank you, Emerson. Thank you, guys, and Noel and Harry and your team for what you're doing. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the advice, and thank you for, for doing this. We'll talk soon. We'll talk soon.